for the Susan Taylor Podcast, where we discuss the yoga of mind, medicine, and healing. Author of Feeling Good Matters, Sexual Radiance, and the Vital Energy Program, Dr. Taylor imparts authentic knowledge and practical tools that inspire, educate, and empower us to be a healing force for positive change. So join us and take your life and our planet to the next level. Hello and welcome to episode 15, The Neuroscience of Focus, a look at how our brain focuses. In today's episode, we're going to talk about what goes on in our brain when we focus. I'm going to be talking about this today because I've received several inquiries over the last few weeks about what happens to our brain when we're focused and what happens when we're out of focus. I'll also discuss the changes that take place when our mind drifts off when we meditate and in life for that matter, and discuss some ideas for you to develop more focus in your life. I'm really looking forward to speaking on these topics. Without further ado, let's get started. In order to be successful at almost anything, you need to be able to focus. As I mentioned in the last podcast, Train Your Focus, it's been said that we need 10,000 hours to be an expert. We also mention that this is not always the case because we do all have different abilities to sustain our attention. Why focus? Well, focus allows us to direct all of our mental and physical faculties towards one object and it allows us to avoid distraction and confusion. This enables us to maintain a vital and calm mind. Keep this in mind, focus actually helps maintain a vital and calm mind. Many of us struggle with focus because we're digitally hijacked. With the best intentions, we find ourselves being lured away by our senses, exploring new happenings on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. And there's many others, of course. We engage in topics that we weren't even considering initially. Our ability to focus is something that seems to be a skill of the past. In fact, our brains are rewiring to support the lack of focus because of constant disruptive bombardment of social media, sound bites, and other clickbait for that matter. But what exactly does it mean to focus? How does our brain work when we're distracted versus focused? To focus in meditation, and on any project for that matter, requires that we hold our attention on an object for a specific length of time. It also requires that we are aware of our wandering mind and we're able to bring our wandering mind back to calmness and then sustain focus. These transactions are all recorded in our brain networks. And our brain networks in meditation, especially having a meditation practice, change with our ability or lack of ability to maintain focus on a single object. Researchers have learned about brain networks through utilizing brain imaging scans. These allow researchers to see precisely which parts of the brain are active and non-active during specific activities. The active parts light up during a specific task, whereas when they're not lit up, they're really not engaged in the task at hand. And that's how they determine what parts of the brain are active or not. When we apply this concept to our meditation practice, let's say focused awareness, that's where we bring our mindfulness into focus, we can see how our brain networks can change with practice over time. Notice I said can change depending on your mind's ability to stay focused. We all know that's much easier said than done. Let's look at the process. But while looking at the process that I'm going to cover, keep in mind that when we report on what brain areas do relate to our physiology or task at hand, it's very simplified. In other words, the brain's integrated networks have different areas and each area is responsible for many activities, not just the few that I might mention. Just keep that in mind This overview will give you an idea, though, of what really goes on during the practice of bringing mindfulness into focus. 
We first create the focus. And what we do is we start by creating a task. We use breathing, for example, or mantra. Today I'll talk more about breathing. We breathe with our focus at the base of the nostrils. Our attention gets focused there. and We watch the breath as we inhale and exhale. A very good point here is to say we use breath because breath is physiologically beneficial to our whole nervous system. So you're getting uh, an added benefit of not just focus, but you're also working with the sympathetic and parasympathetic branches of the nervous system, which is very, very beneficial. When we focus on this area, for example, the prefrontal cortex, Specifically, the dorsal prefrontal cortex stays active. That's our area of activity. That's our CEO, actually, of the brain. This area is known for its ability to work with other parts of the brain, which together make up a network of regions known as the executive control network. Again, I said the CEO. It's the executive control network. This network is also associated with working memory, cognitive flexibility, for example, when we plan or we have reason to do something. So it's considered a higher functioning of the brain. When we focus, all areas do get involved and are mainly orchestrated by the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. So that's our orchestra leader. This area of the prefrontal cortex also has the ability to suppress information that you you aren't interested in. See, so it also has the ability to say, wait a minute, we call it put the brakes on. It puts the brakes on any incoming sensory data that we really don't want to be paying attention to. But we all know that this focus will only last as long as the practitioner, that's you and I, are able to hold our attention. Even those with the best focusing skills still are tempted by distractions, leading them to drift. And when I use the word drift, I mean where the focus diminishes and the mind wanders off. And then this brings us to the next phase, just in case you drifted and your mind has wandered off into another engaging or perhaps more interesting conversation in your mind. And so now we're heading in the opposite direction of where we started. At this point during the drift, the mind wandering, the brain activity shifts away from focus by a thought or feeling that surfaced in the mind field, as I mentioned. Scientists have found that the drift shifts brain activity to the posterior cingular cortex, the precaneus, and other areas of the brain around the area of the limbic system. That's our emotional center. And that's a contributor of the distraction network. At this point, depending on your experience with practice and with the practice of focus specifically, you may or may not become aware of your drift and you may be further out in imaginary land than you even know, but you'll come around sooner or later. I remember when I first started practicing, I didn't even know that I was drifting off. Only now do I get to pay attention and say, and I get to pull myself back much quicker. But this comes with practice. We next have to bring our awareness to the scene. As I just mentioned, that takes some practice. Once we've drifted, at some point we recognize that we've gone astray. The longer we practice being focused, the quicker our awareness kicks in. Thanks to what's called the salience network, the anterior insula, and the anterior cingulate cortex. And that functions to segregate the most important, that's the word salience, the important among the internal and extrapersonal sensory stimuli in order to guide our behavior. This network together with its interconnected brain networks contribute to a variety of complex brain functions. And these include communication, social behavior, and self-awareness. And this happens through the integration. Again, when we think of the anterior insula, think of integration of the sensory, emotional, and cognitive information. That's like the hub in the airport, air traffic control. It knows what's going and coming. So we gain our awareness and begin to reorient our awareness to where we were in the first place, our breath, at the base of the nostrils. So we use breath to bring our attention back. 
And that's why we use uh, coming back to focus. We use breath or mantra. It helps anchor the mind and bring it back because the mind's nature is to drift. It's to be distracted, disturbed, and even stupefied. We must train it to be calm and tranquil. With the help of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, that's where we started in the beginning with focus, and the inferior parietal lobe, we're able to let go of our distracted object of attention and come back full circle to our calm and focused center. In the case of our meditation practice, again, back to our breath or mantra. These tools also help to guide us back And that's why they're so beneficial. They're not just added in when people say, oh, I just listened to a word. Really, we want to have significance in the words that we choose for mantra or the sounds. I'd rather use the word sounds because they're really not words. They're sounds. And those sounds are very useful for the mind to be brought back to its center place. We're finally back to our base. And then we can practice holding the point of focus. At this time, The dorsolateral prefrontal cortex continues to stay active for as long as the meditation practitioner holds the focus, utilizing the breath or mantra, depending on what is chosen. We see that training the mind with focus engages the brain areas and builds new networks that support a clear, tranquil, and focused mind. Over time, these networks become strong, and actually the distraction centers tend to go offline. And then the prefrontal cortex holds the focus for longer periods. So the more you practice, the longer and longer uh, anything that would bubble up to create a distraction will no longer really be there. The neurons will wire together, supporting the efforts that you've made over time. It just takes practice, as I mentioned in the last podcast. Why all this information? If you recall, when you gain knowledge, and that's why practice works, then you increase your brain matter. As I mentioned before in a a former podcast and blog, I talked to you about the myelin sheath thickening as we learn and create new knowledge. And that also gives you the sustainability in the practice itself. Because sometimes it's very, very easy to drift off and then get up and walk away. But we want a practice that's sustainable. It's not enough to just read about it and hear about it. We must actually engage in the practice. That's a lot of information. And how can you use it to improve your focus in real life? The first thing is to remain calm, consciously aware, living in the moment. Awareness training is the key. There's no actual definition for awareness. It's just being. People use the word mindfulness, but awareness goes one step further beyond the mind, and it's being present, totally present in the moment. We know that being free from stress supports brain networks and keeps our capacity for attention and memory very, very strong. And that's why remaining calm is so beneficial. We can look at the word remain calm as not being stressed, because any time we're consciously aware living in the moment, we don't have stress. Second is to recognize that the brain can change. Thanks to the science of neuroplasticity, our brain areas that support focus and resilience can be trained with consistent practice in meditation. And over time, you will improve. Third, Be aware of the habit of switching your attention quickly from one thing to another during the day. Pay close attention to what you're doing in the moment. It's not useful to talk with someone while you're doing something else. This is something that many of us are guilty of doing in modern age, thanks to our tendency to multi-screen and increased need for instant gratification. How many of you have been on a phone call and you're with someone and you're really focusing and you're giving them your time and they're multitasking, either doing dishes or they're working in the oven or they're cooking or they're on their computer and you hear that sudden uh, stop or you hear the bang. I know it's happened to me several times and it's really not appropriate when people are speaking with other people to be doing something else. Give people your full attention and time. And if you don't have the time to do it, then choose choose another time. Fourth, 
before you embark on something where you want to place your focus, know your why. Knowing your why uh, enables you to do something. It makes a strong emotional connection in the limbic area of our brain. And it allows us to have purpose and reason and our practices can be sustained much longer. And finally, to prevent outside factors from hijacking your attention away from what you're meant to be doing, create a schedule for yourself. When you want to meditate, make that your priority. When you want to eat, make that your priority. And schedule things according to what you need to support your health and well-being. With all these great ideas, one thing is clear, and I'll emphasize this, our diet and nutritional habits are responsible for giving the essential nutrients to support our brain network. Keep in mind diet and nutritional habits, what we feed our body, what we feed our mind, is responsible. They're the essential nutrients to support our brain network. And I'm going to get started on these topics in the next few podcasts. Well, this brings us to the end of this episode. If you'd like to be notified weekly for new podcasts, please subscribe. The Susan Taylor podcast is available on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and TuneIn, and on susantaylor.org. And if you like the podcast, give us a rating. Those ratings will help us in developing new content for you. Contact us at susantaylor.org if you have any questions, comments, or feedback. And thank you for listening. The Susan Taylor Podcast comes out every week. And again, questions, comments, and something you might want to hear, let me know. Until next time, remain calm.